Hey there, and welcome to Covenant Church. We are so glad that you are with us wherever you're watching, however you're watching. We're so glad that you would join us right now. My name is Tanner, and I'm on the team here. And again, it's a huge deal to us that you would spend some of your time here with us at Covenant Church, and we're glad that you are a part of our family. Just wanted to let you know, if this is your first time and you're, you're, you're watching a message with us right now for the first time, again, so grateful that you're here. If you wouldn't mind doing me a favor, though, we would love to meet you. We'd love to connect with you. So if you would grab your phone and text the word NEW to 252-304-0222, we'd love to meet you, get to know your name, get to hear some of your story. And we have a gift card that we would love to get to you. And one of our team members is going to reach out to you soon. So again, thank you so much for being here. And we hope you enjoy this message. I wanted to start today by just uh, thanking you. Uh, there's been such a uh, tremendous outpouring of uh, love uh, toward me and my family over the last month. Uh, I've received cards and really nice words from so many of you uh, at the death of my father. And I, I really do appreciate that. This congregation is uh, tops. So just really appreciate you. Listen, it's been, it's been five weeks now since my dad died. And so um, I know some of you have had to do this too. My brother and my sister and I have been at my dad's house. We've been doing some cleaning. We've been cleaning out uh, drawers and uh, closets and desks. And uh, as we've been doing this, we have made an amazing discovery. My dad cornered the market on notepads and address labels. I mean, I, I kid you not, uh, I don't know how there are any notepads left in the world. There are, there are hundreds of them. You couldn't make that many notes if you live to be a, a thousand years, I mean, there, there are just stacks and stacks of these. And address labels, I mean, there must be a hundred thousand of them. They're everywhere. Every drawer, every desk, closets stacked with address labels. So you might wonder, well, why did your dad buy so many notepads and get so many address labels? Well, he didn't buy any of them. They were sent to him in the mail as gifts for donating to charitable organizations. And so, you know, I've been, they all have his name on them and they have these, uh, these organizations that he donated to. Uh, I'm the executor of the estate and so I'm also the one that gets to open all the mail. So every day. Every day, there, there's a stack of mail. Sometimes it's a stack like this. And uh, people are still mailing, mailing him uh, solicitations for funds. I mean, they just come all the time. Sometimes we'd call it junk mail. Uh, for him, it was uh, people that actually, people he had supported. And so it's been really cool to learn something about my dad I did not know. Uh, what a generous giver he was. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm opening envelopes. I'm, I'm seeing all these. I mean, I knew he gave to his church, gave generously to his local church because the last couple of years I've written the checks. So I, I know how much he's been giving there. But, I mean, he's been giving to uh, missions organizations, missionaries. I mean, I've had to write missionaries and say, you know, not... There's not any more going to come because my dad passed away. Just how many of those? Um, he, he gave to the March of Dimes. I don't know if you know what the March of Dimes uh, helps families who have children that have, uh, have to spend time in the hospital, that have um, you know, life-threatening situations. Um, the March of Dimes gave a gift to my mother and daddy in 1971 when their son was having heart surgery at Duke, me. And they made a lifetime giver out of him because he's been paying it forward ever since. Um, I, I've, just, I've just been amazed at uh, the list of things that he donated to. He was in the Exchange Club, which is like the Kiwanis or the Lions 
club. And they do scholarships for high school students. And so he's been pouring in money to send other people's children to college through these scholarships. Uh, One other organization, which apparently he gave a lot of money to, was the Society for the Blind. There was this woman... In that ran a cafeteria in his building when he was working in Raleigh that was blind. She was the manager of the cafeteria and she was blind. And I know he thought an awful lot of her. He started giving to the Society of the, for the Blind. And not ironically, at the end of his life, he was struggling with his own eyes. And so his donations just went up as he gave. So again... Uh, I've been discovering just what a generous person my dad was. And uh, that's, been, that's been fun to see. Now, it wasn't always that way because <clears throat> my daddy did not come from a wealthy family. He grew up on a farm. He was born in 1936 during the Depression. He was raised as a young boy during World War II. Again, on this farm, my mother was born just after that. And so uh, they... They were not rich people, and they never made a big salary. They were state employees. They they just uh, they they managed to uh, to you know clothe us, feed us, and um, and send us to school. But they they never had a whole lot of money to be able to give. And I would even say, kind of came from a depression mindset where you didn't give. Uh, generously. So again, it wasn't always that way, but over time they learned how to give. They learned how to be generous. And, and I would just say, I think that's the way for every single person. Being generous is not natural. It's, it's natural to a few people who happen to be spiritually gifted. They have the gift of giving. But for most people, we have the gift of spending Right? We have the gift of getting. We have the gift of hoarding, holding. It is hard to get our hands open. It's something that you have to work on and develop. But I I do know this about every single person who's here, every single person listening to me, is that there's not a single person in here. If you had the choice of whether you'd like to be known as a stingy person or a generous person, I know what you'd choose. Every one of us in our hearts would like to be someone who was known for their generosity. And so this, this message is actually going to talk about becoming the person that you want to be and working on this goal of generosity. Now, we've, we've been in a series over the last month called uh, Don't Be That Guy. And we've been looking at some of the worst people in the Bible, hadn't we? Some of the worst folks. And and today's guy is actually a couple. A a man named Ananias and his wife, Sapphira. And uh, we're going to read their story in Acts chapter 5. But to actually understand... What it says in Acts chapter 5, we're going to need to go back into Acts chapter 4 and read the last few verses. And what we'll read in Acts 4 is really a summary picture of what the early church looked like, how they related to each other. So this is a, this is a picture, a word picture, of the followers of Jesus after the death and resurrection and ascension, after Jesus went back to heaven. And this is how the believers, the folks who are following Jesus, served and loved each other and related to each other. Listen to what it says. It says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. 
For from time to time, those who owned lands and houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Now, that, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty great story, isn't it? I mean, I want you to notice three things that are, that are going on here. First of all, you see the evidence of the Holy Spirit in, in the, the body of believers. There, the Holy Spirit is moving. Uh, God is moving in the hearts of people. And the result is great generosity. I mean, in fact, it's a, it's a cause and effect. Because uh, people are usually not generous unless something has happened to their heart. And obviously something has gone on here uh, to, to happen to their heart. It's not natural to be uh, a giver of your things to other people. Now maybe you'd give a little, but not in abundance like these folks. So um, it's, it's why we might say giving is not natural, it's supernatural. When God does something, it, it, it opens your heart to be someone different. Uh, notice also, there's an excitement about the mission. Because the, the church is, is exploding and growing and, and bringing people in. The, the power and the presence of the risen Lord Jesus is evident. And it even says that people were coming to faith daily. Now, if, if you were part of a church where people came to the Lord every single day, well, that'd be exciting, wouldn't it? Every day there were new people. Um, that happens in other places in the world. I mean, in Africa, it's like 18,000 new believers a day in Africa. Okay, it's happening every single day. Well, there's an excitement there. And when there's an excitement, you want to invest in excitement. And so, you know, it's the same today. You know, if, if you understand the mission of what we're doing as a church, you want to be a part of it. You want to invest in what God is doing. Because listen, we're still in the business of bringing people to Jesus. We're still in the business of discipling people to maturity. We're still in the business of raising up leaders to be able to influence the world. And our offering supports the mission. Now, it also keeps the lights on. It paves the parking lot. But all those things support the mission. And so there were a lot of people that were excited about the mission, and they put their money where their mission was. And then the last thing here, there's a, an example here of just outpouring of love toward people. I mean, notice that uh, it says there wasn't anybody that had a need. When there was a need, they met it. And what we know about the early church is that they had something called a widow's list. The widow's list were women whose husbands had died that didn't have any family members to help them. And so they were, they were without any support. The church put them on a list to help them, to make sure that they didn't fall through the cracks. Uh, the church, the early church was all about orphans because a lot of people... If they could not afford to take care of their children, they just threw them out into the street. They abandoned children that they did not want. And the church, because we are in love with Jesus and Jesus loves the little children, they would scoop up these abandoned children and adopt them into their own families. Um, it says that any family who had a need, the church came alongside them and tried to help them. Now, you know, it says, and, and not only did they know that in the church, but the community knew that. And so you understand why people in the community said, hey, those people really love each other, and you understand why they'd want to be a part of a church like that. Well, that's what we read here. And then we read an example, a person who is actually giving in a generous manner, someone who is moved by the Holy Spirit, who is excited about the mission, and who his heart has compassion for, for the needs of his brothers and sisters. 
And he gives in an extraordinary way. It says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This was an extraordinary man. Now, I don't know if he got his nickname because he was generous or whether since he was so generous, the apostles just called him Mr. Encouragement, which, by the way, that's what his name means. Wouldn't you like for someone to just see you and go, there's Mr. Encouragement right there. Well, Barnabas, which it means son of encouragement, was quite an example to the entire group of believers. They all recognized him as someone who was greatly generous. Now, you're probably thinking, well, I thought you weren't supposed to let people know what you give. You don't, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is giving. Well, that's true. You're not supposed to show off with your gifts, but there is no sense of that here. What you have here is someone who is so moved, his heart is so open to the, the Holy Spirit that he is always, there's not a hint of pride, he's just wanting to bless with the resources that he has. And Barnabas ends up being a leader in the church, and so he's a leader in many ways, but he's a leader in giving. And his giving inspires other people to be generous. Well, then we come to Acts chapter 5, and what we're going to read here is a contrast. In fact, the word in the NIV is, going to, is, is the word now, but it could be but or yet. So I'm going to read it that way because there's a contrast between Barnabas and our man of the hour, Ananias. It says, but a man named Ananias, together with his wife, Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young man came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her and buried her beside her husband. Now, can we just agree that it would have been really awkward to be on the usher team that day at church, right? Excuse me, will the ushers please come down and help the man on the third row? He seems to have dropped dead. I mean, this is, this is a... This is quite a story. And I guess that my question is, is this, um, what was the problem? I mean, if you, th if, if you look at the situation, uh, Ananias and Sapphira actually gave a very generous gift. They sold, they were moved just like Barnabas was moved. And they wanted to do something to help their local church. And they sold a piece of property. 
And they, they gave to the, the body, to the work, to the mission. Uh, the, the, the problem, the difference is that they pretended to take, to have given all the value of the land or the price that they sold, and they did it as an act of worship. And they really, what they, what they got credit for was really not the truth. Now again, this question, I mean, if you've got something and you sell it and you want to give, uh, you want to tithe on your income, let's say you tithe on what you've got, or you want to give a gift from it, do you have to give the whole amount that you get from it? If you had a, a stock or a piece of land or a house or a car or something, I mean, do you have to give it all? Well, of course not. In fact, Ananias and Sapphira could have said, we are so moved by the work of God that we have sold a piece of land and we got, this, we, we got an amount for it and we're going to give half of the proceeds to the work of God. And you know what? That would have been awesome, wouldn't it? That would have been perfectly fine, marvelous. And I would even say generous. But uh, that, is, that is not what they did. They lied. And they wanted to get credit for being outrageously generous without having to actually be outrageously generous. And God, Peter called them out on it. Peter said, um, why has Satan filled your heart? And this, by the way, is... I want to say a direct contrast to what we read about Barnabas. Barnabas has got a heart filled with the Holy Spirit. And, he, and Peter says, your heart is not big. Your heart is shriveled up. Why, have, why has Satan you know, been cramping your, your heart, making it smaller? Why have you allowed your heart to be filled with such greed? And to lie to God about this. In other words, they were fakers. They were fake givers. Uh, they, wanted to, they wanted to look like Barnabas. They just didn't want to give like Barnabas. And again, this is the tough part of the story. It says they dropped dead. Now, I, I wonder if they dropped dead with embarrassment. You know, hey, you know, if somebody calls you out on your gift, it, it's like I, I, I was so embarrassed that I just fell over dead. I, I don't know. But they died. They both died. And I, 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 don't, I don't know what really happened here because the text doesn't tell us why exactly. And, and it could be that um, what we're seeing here is that they're... Their deceit is sin. And the problem is that sin is always contagious. Sin spreads to other people. And that might have been what happened in this couple's marriage. It could be that um, Sapphira did not actually want to go along with what her husband had proposed but because they were married, she didn't say anything. And she supported his lie later. And that was not a good thing to do. It could be that Ananias was really moved and wanted to sell something that was their, their only resource. And he wanted to give it. But Sapphira was saying, well, look, it's okay to sell it, but don't give it all away. You know, hold some of it back for us. Um, and, you know, you can tell them, tell them that you gave it all, but, you know, hold on to it. I don't know. We'll never know. Uh, what we do know is that the Spirit of God, in this case, did not let the sin spread. It says in verse 11, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. You think? <laughs> you think? Something happened today at church, you won't believe it was somebody who gave an offering and woo, the guy died. I mean, people sitting in church that day, there was at least one guy who said, honey, did you bring the checkbook? I, I think this would be a good day to maybe add to what we're doing. 
Well, listen, uh, before you grab your checkbook, <laughs> I, this, is not really, this is not really a message about money as much it, it, as it is a message about the kind of person that you want to be or you want to become. I mean, this is, this is the question is, you know, do you want to be like Barnabas? Or would you like to be more like Ananias? I mean, what is the kind of person you want to look like? And I think it's an easy question. We don't want to be like Ananias. Every one of us would like to be like Barnabas. Someone who is open-handed. Someone who is known for their encouragement and their generosity. And so, again, the question is not, who do you want to be? Because I think all of us would like to be like Barnabas. The question is, how do, you get to, how do you get there? How do you get to be a generous person with an open heart toward the things of God? Now, the answer is, you decide that that's who you want to be. You make a decision. At some point, you, you draw a line and you say, I want to become, I want to be or become or be more like Barnabas. I want to be an extremely generous person. And it's not just words. You don't just say it. You, make a de- you decide, you make a decision, and then you start pursuing that goal. You, you choose some things that are going to get you to that point. You start pursuing it intentionally. You know, I, I think a lot of people want to be like that, but then they, then they look at their own situation, or they, they go back to the things that they've learned, and I think they're just roadblocks which we've got to get past, or we'll never be generous people. You know, that I would call it, in some ways, you know, lies or untruths that we, we have about money or that someone has taught us about money. Uh, for instance, um, some people say, well, I will never be able to give. I, I will never have extra to be able to be a generous person. You know, and I... I would just say, well, I hope that's not the case for you. I hope you would not say, yep, I'm going to have a shriveled up heart all of my life. Because that would be a sad thing. No one wants to be that person. So how do, you, how do you get to the place? You say, well, I don't have anything to give. Well, how do you get to the place where you do have something to give? Well, you begin to work on your generosity. Now, I hear people say all the time, hey, well, if I ever win the lottery, I'm going to be generous, <laughs> right? If I, if I had a million dollars, I would be generous. And I would just say, no, you wouldn't because the statistics don't lie. The statistics say that the more you have, the less you give. Certainly, the less of a percentage you give, the more you have. And so, The way that you become a generous person, you start when you have nothing. Have you ever noticed how generous children are? They love to give. You go, well, they don't have anything to give, right? So they give it away. It's not a problem. Would you like to have it? I'll give you this. Their hearts are open to give, which is why we must teach our children when they are young to be givers. That it's not about just getting, it's giving is where you want your heart to be. You start when you have nothing to give. You start when you, because it's easy, by the way, when you got nothing, and then you get a little bit, it's easy to say, well, I haven't got much, so I can give a little bit of that. When you get more, something happens to your heart. Again, generosity starts when you have almost zero. Now, some, some of you are going, well, that's good because I've got zero, right? 
You know, I'm in debt. I'm in debt. I can't give anything. I mean, I owe a bunch of other people. Well, listen, you, then you got to make a choice. I got I to gotta get out of debt so I can be able to give because I want to be a giver. I don't want to just be a payer, right? Listen, this church made a decision last year that we were going to buy enough memberships to Financial Peace University so that every family in the church could have one for free. Do you know that? For free. And so you can have one today if you'd like. Uh, it will, that course, and you don't have to come to a class, you can do it on your own. If you'd like to have one, all you got to do is just text FPU. You can have a free membership today. But it's not just for people who are in debt. The goal of Financial Peace University is to be financially able to live and give like nobody else. Because you want to be a generous person. It will teach you, it will get you to the place where you can be generous. You know, Jesus told a parable one time, and he said that this, this uh, man had several servants, and he gave them a little bit to manage. And then he came back, and they had, the ones that had managed it well, he gave them more. And I think that's the way God treats us. If you manage that well, I'll give you a little more. If you manage that well, I'll give you a little more. Um, Matthew 25, his master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. But you start your generosity journey with nothing. Okay? The, the second uh, statement a lot of people say is, you know, uh, if I give, <clears throat> I'm not sure there'll be enough left for me. You know, like if I give what I have... Um, I, I'm not sure there will be enough to meet my needs. And I would tell you that would be true if there was an, a limited supply of stuff in the world. Or if we didn't have a God who owned everything and who promised that he would take care of us. And so if you go, well, if I give what God gave me away, there won't be enough. Well, no, he's got plenty. He's got a lot. Look what it says in Psalm 50. This is God's words. <clears throat> For every... Animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains, and the creatures of the field are mine. If I were hungry, that means if I were in need, I would not tell you, for the world is mine, and all that is in it. Who owns the world? Our Father in heaven owns the world, and He's got enough to be able to provide for us and do it richly. So that means if I'm generous, he'll be more generous back and he can fill the tank. And then this last one, this really is the key. It's wrong thinking, but it's, it's what a lot of people think. And I certainly have thought this myself. My money belongs to me. My money is mine. I'm an owner. But that's not true. I'm actually... A manager of someone else's money. I'm, I'm a manager. Now listen, when you get that in your head, what I have, what I've been given does not belong to me. It belongs to someone else. Wait, it just changes the way you handle money. Listen, I told you at the beginning, I'm the executor of my father's will, which means I'm the executing officer of my dad's money. It's not my money. And now I'm, I happen to be a beneficiary, but I can't just say, well, I'm going to take more than my share. Or I'm not going to give to that charitable organization because I don't like it. No, I have to do what is in the will because it's not mine. I have to follow the directions. And that's the way we manage God's money. Lord, it's yours. What do you want me to do with it? Because it's not mine. And look, when you figure out that it's not yours and that God's got enough... <laughs> and that you can be a generous giver because you're giving away someone else's money, man, you can pass it out like crazy. It is fun to spend someone else's money. And that's really what generosity is. It is when you choose to do that. 
Now listen, I, I've, I have made the choice, and it's not a new choice, but I, I've made the choice that I want to be a generous person. I, I want to be a Barnabas. And the re, part of the reason that I made that choice is because I have seen three men in my life that are such incredible givers that I want to be like them when I grow up. I mean, they are so amazing at giving. They give. Every time you turn around, they're giving. They're giving. They've given to me that I, I really want to be generous like them. That's what happened with Barnabas. I mean, he inspired people. Well, I want to be someone who encourages and inspires. And so I've, I've made some decisions in my life that I, I'm going to be generous. And so I, I want to just share several decisions, things that I, I'm doing. These are steps for me. Uh, the first one is that I've decided, and my wife is in agreement with me, that uh, we want to give a larger percentage away every year of our life. So, listen, I started a long time ago on the, the tithe decision, right? I, I started tithing when I was 10, all right? And the only time I've really struggled with it is the year that uh, Taff was pregnant with our daughter, and uh, she quit her job, and then the church, for some reason, decided that they needed to lower my salary that year. So they dropped my salary by $4,000, and, uh, and I said, well, we can't do it anymore. We can't tithe. But I could not do it. I, I've been doing it. This is what I've, I'm supposed to do. I'm returning this to God. So we did it anyway. We wrote the check even though we didn't know how we were going to make it. And that's when the council chair of my church said, I don't know who made this dumb decision to cut our pastor's salary. You know, his wife's pregnant and she just quit her job. We need to give him more money. And so they restored it and gave me a raise. Funny how that happens, isn't it? You know, when you say, I'm going to do what God's asked me to do. So the tithe is not the thing for me. I, it is, I want to give more of an, a percentage every single year. Okay? And, and that's what we're trying to do. Now, the second thing is, I've decided I'm going to listen to, with, with, the, with Holy Spirit ears, to every ask for kingdom money. That means every single person that comes my way and is asking me to help them, support them, and it's a kingdom kind of value. It's a Christian thing, church thing. Uh, I'm going to say yes, no matter, no matter what the ask, unless the Holy Spirit tells me no. Because I figure, you know, if God sends that person to me, it's not my money. And I just want to be open-handed with his money. Okay? Now, that was, that was scary when I started. But anyway, it's really worked out well. Because it's fun to give. The last thing I would say is that um, I am always looking for places that I can bless people. So, I, mean, I have set, a, I set aside a pile of money so that I can just bless. And um, you know what? It is fun to bless. It is just fun to be able to, to bless people and to help folks. Okay? So, you know, people have blessed me. So all I'm doing is just paying it. I'm just paying it forward. I'm just paying it forward. And, and it is exciting. So listen, you know the reason that we give, right? The reason that we give is because we serve a God who is such a giver. He's a giver. He, he is given to us. In fact, if you read the Bible, the word give right next to God happens all the time. Right? God gave His one and only Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus the Son has given to us, right? He gave himself on the cross. He shed his blood for us. He is worthy of us to be outrageously generous. So really, Barnabas is not my example. Jesus is my example. And because he is so worthy, he is worthy that's what I just got to think all that. He is so worthy for all he has done for me. You know, 
I want my hands to always be open to anything that he puts on my heart. How about you? Let's pray. Father, thank you for that you have been so good to us, so generous toward us. Lord, the, when the Holy Spirit is put in our hearts and starts to work and open our, open our hearts and make them uh, wide open to, your, to your, your, your love and your concerns, I mean, we, we want to participate in that. We love what you're doing in this world. We want to help. And we thank you that you've been so good to us that you've put resources in our hands for us to manage for you. And we want to do it well. Lord, mostly, uh, every one of us in here wants to, we want to get to the end of our life and have a, a pile of notepads and address labels that our children see and go, you know, my parents my grandparents, my brother, my sister, they were so generous to the things of God. I want to be like that. And Lord, thank you. And we thank you for your generosity again toward us in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, let's stand. There is no one who is more worthy of our praise and our generosity than the Lord Jesus. There is no one more worthy of our praise. His name is beautiful. His, his person is beautiful. And so we worship and we praise Him.